Hi, we're going to talk about addiction. What is addiction? I know it's kind of confusing. I myself didn't know anything about it until I was actually a patient in rehab. But before I go any further, of course, introductions are in order. That's me. Hi, everybody. Dr. Jason Powers, Chief Medical Officer of Right Step in Promises Austin. Do you know what this is? This is the first commercially available cell phone. When I was a kid, the only people that had these were doctors, and I thought they were pretty cool toys, so I wanted to be a doctor just so I can have one. Plus, doctors got called away to do some pretty cool stuff, just kind of like Superman. Joking aside, I do not believe I'm Superman, but it's still pretty cool to be a doctor. I mean, that's where the statement comes from. Trust me, I'm a doctor. People respect doctors. It takes a while to get through school, and you know, we help people. Most of us anyway. But I wasn't this kind of doctor. I was more like this kind of doctor. I wasn't a sober doctor. Now, I wasn't chasing people around with a lazy eye and a syringe, but I wasn't doing too well. So one day I woke up, and everybody I knew was around my bedside intervening on me. Tried to make me go to rehab. I said no, no, no. After I gave them some creative places they could go, I thought, now my life's over. The gig is up. They know. Right, they know I'm a dirtbag. I thought that's what alcoholics and addicts were, so I figured, as long as you didn't know, then I'd be okay. But once the gig was up and I was exposed like this open house here in Louisiana post-Katrina, I felt demolished, hopeless, and helpless. I really didn't feel like I had anywhere to go. Yet a counselor in treatment said, don't worry, be happy. You've got to be joking. What do you mean? And he said, well, addiction is a disease. I'll get to that later, but I didn't believe that for a minute. He said, addiction is a disease, and like any disease, it really doesn't care who you are, what you are, because it affects everybody. Not that it matters, but you're in good company. What do you mean I'm in good company? I looked around me, and the people I was in company with were really not doing so well either. Some were shaking, others crying, one guy was drooling. I said, you must be kidding me. Well, Robert Downey Jr. has addiction. Christopher Kennedy Lawford, well, in fact, a lot of the Kennedys have it. Josh Hamilton, Betty Ford, Edgar Allan Poe, Mark Twain, oh, and the whole U.S. Congress. If you notice, I try to infuse humor in my presentations mostly because humor is one of those things that can help turn even the darkest of times into learning moments. I don't do this to discount the hell of addiction. It's bad and very serious. I was there, and I could be there again. But if it's not funny, it's real life, and that is too sad. The fact is, you know, humor is good medicine. Humor has many real-life applications as well. Repatriated Vietnam prisoners of war said making light of the intolerable was more helpful to them than religion. From naming the horrific prisoner of war camp the Hanawai Hilton to scratching the note, smile, you're on candid camera on the walls of the decrepit shower stall, prisoners of war found a temporary mental escape from the prison walls. Believe it or not, said one survivor, even under the almost worst conditions over there, under the right circumstance, we could laugh. In addiction recovery fellowships, Members insist on humor. Their rule number 62 is not to take oneself too seriously. 12-step meetings are the only places you can find people laughing heartily about failed suicide attempts. Doing so is not evidence of moral baseness. Instead, it's a way members support one another. They know that if it's not funny, it's too real. And let's face it, the dark desperation that leads to suicidal thoughts, let alone attempts, is wretched on a nuclear scale. Humor has been identified as one of the 24 character strengths considered vital to human thriving. And in the first study of its kind, researchers found that people who can laugh at themselves tended to be more cheerful. The ancient Greeks took it a step further. To them, laughter was truly the best medicine. The term humor derives from the Greeks' humoral medicine, which taught that the balance of fluids in the human body known as humors controlled human health and emotion. Maybe that's why we find comfort in laughter, even in the worst of circumstances. Addiction is a big bad disease with huge costs. Specifically, it costs us over $400 billion annually in such things as missed work and lost wages, 
and costs associated with the criminal justice and healthcare systems. But you cannot put a money value on human suffering. The pain of addiction is so wretched, words can hardly describe it. And so I often use this image to convey the despair and agony of addiction. This is a self-portrait of the famous Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh, who was an alcoholic and died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. It's said that religion is for people that don't want to go to hell, and recovery is for people who have been to hell and don't want to go back. Let me tell you, the suffering is immeasurable. It is just absolutely terrible. Why is everything except alcohol, other drugs, for example, gambling, computer, food, sex, and love, all lumped together in one broad category of addiction? Ethanol is the mind-altering drug in alcohol. It works in the same part of the brain, and it leads to the same predictable and horrible consequences as any addiction. Basically, it's all the same one-ton gorilla on your back. So alcohol is alcohol addiction. Why does alcohol get its own category? Alcohol is special, albeit arbitrarily. Alcohol is certainly not the most benign drug human beings abuse, but since it's been around the longest, it simply had more time to ingratiate itself into our psyche. After thousands of years, it has managed to become enmeshed in our cultural DNA. For example, alcohol is part of many religious rituals. Weddings, birthdays, anniversaries, New Year's Eve, and St. Patrick's Day are but a few other examples where alcohol plays an integral role in American culture. Some think alcohol is special because it's legal, but it's illegal until you're 21. And alcohol is special for the fact that alcohol drug dealers, they're allowed to advertise on television, unlike nicotine or cocaine drug dealers. Who could deny the specialness of booze? To be sure, alcohol is a mind-altering, abusable drug like cocaine and heroin. Ethanol, again, the active intoxicating ingredient, is a central nervous system depressant drug. Like all drugs of abuse, alcohol mainly exerts its effects and causes dysfunction in the mesolimbic dopamine system, also known as the addiction center. Additionally, the signs and symptoms of alcohol addiction scratch that alcoholism are just as predictable and generally identical to every other drug of abuse. Alcohol addiction is just as wretched as heroin addiction. Alcoholism is a deadly disease, period. So it's all addiction. But for the purposes of this presentation, we'll focus on chemical dependency, which is alcohol and other drugs. Think about it. What does this person have? Cocaineism? And what about Snoop? Does he have marijuanaism? So I must have a disclaimer here. I got this picture off the internet. I don't know if that's really marijuana, but I do know he doesn't have marijuana-ism. What are drugs anyway? A simple and accurate way to describe them is as tools. To start with, they're powerful. That is, nothing as natural is as strong as the chemicals that we abuse. What do I mean by that? After all, certain things make us feel pretty darn great. You might feel happy, experience some pleasure when you dance, win an award, surf at sunrise, or eat a great meal. But the amount of pleasurable neurotransmitters that are released when certain drugs are put into the body, cross into the brain, are stronger and longer lasting than anything that happens naturally. Experiences that cause pleasure do so because the brain releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which is primarily produced in this area, which is called the ventral tegmental area, or VTA. Dopamine then travels along the reward pathway to a lot of different parts of the brain, such as the amygdala, which deals with emotions, the nucleus accumbens, which controls your body's motor functions, the prefrontal cortex, which helps focus attention and planning, and the hippocampus, which is responsible for the formation of memories. These comprise the mesolimbic dopamine system, a horseshoe-shaped collection of brain structures and neural pathways located deep within our brains. Involved with survival, emotions, and reward, the limbic system is rich in pleasure-producing dopamine, and it's the common site of action for all addictive substances. And drugs are readily available. That is, they're not hard to find. So they work in the pleasure center, and that's a big reason why they capture our attention. They're motivating that way. But they also are a tool to augment happy feelings. Not authentic happiness, but pleasurable in-the-moment type of hedonic feelings. When people who do not have addiction feel happy, they think, Great, that's it, I'm happy. But some of us with addiction, we're triggered by happiness because we want to feel happier. But obviously, it's not the same thing as authentic happiness. 
So drugs are tools before you have addiction, and they're tools for people who don't even have addiction. They're tools. Everybody deserves some sort of stress relief. And you know, alcohol can decrease anxiety, like Xanax, which is a benzodiazepine medication. Alcohol and benzos, they're anti-anxiety drugs. They can change feelings. They do work. Drink or take Xanax, and you won't feel so anxious or depressed. Take enough, and you won't feel much of anything. We weren't meant to not feel. That's not living. So are drugs good or bad? Well, you know, my wife, she can have some champagne on New Year's. She can even have half a glass and leave it there. I think she's insane for that. I mean, if I wasn't an alcoholic, I would drink all the time. Alcohol is an anti-anxiety drug, and it feels good. Alcohol is also a social lubricant for my wife and many other people who don't stink at drinking like we do. It's good for them, but not so good for us. So what about cocaine? Is cocaine good or bad? A lot of people fall into the trap here and they say, yeah, cocaine is terrible. If you need surgery, it's actually the perfect medication. But it's not so perfect otherwise. So drugs are fundamentally misunderstood in terms of whether or not they're good or bad. In other words, they're neither, and they're both. But in general, addiction is simply misunderstood. And why is it misunderstood? Anytime a disease has bad behavior as a symptom, you're behind the eight ball trying to explain a moral issue for people that just don't get it. Think about schizophrenia. That used to be a moral issue. We used to blame mommies. But today we know it's a brain disease, just as we know addiction is a brain disease too. We're learning more and more about this mysterious organ, the brain. It is complex. And the more we learn, the more addiction as a disease is reinforced. Despite all the recent scientific findings, old ways of viewing addicts and addiction persist. Outdated moral and prejudicial views that addicts are people of weak character who choose to indulge themselves too much continues to be perpetuated by us too. There's a stigma that just doesn't show this undercurrent of shame and judgment in any other disease. If you're looking for the presence of a disease, you do a test, and if it comes back that concludes there's a disease present, what do you say about the results? You just say that the test is positive. Otherwise, no active disease, and you just say the test is negative. And for some reason, it's just accepted in the field of addiction that if you're looking for a positive disease state, it's okay to say dirty. Now, I don't say dirty or clean unless I'm referring to bathing. And anytime you use the word dirty to describe a positive test result, what you're saying too, what anybody is saying, is that the person with it is defective, bad, and weak. This is dirt. This is dirty. This is not what we should be perpetuating. As Oprah Winfrey said, watch your words, for they create the world you live in. Well, what is addiction? It's complicated, and it's not easy to define. So I often use the ancient Asian fable of the three blind men and the elephant to help illustrate the point. The fable tells of three blind men who had heard that an elephant is an amazing animal. One said, it's too bad we can't see an elephant because we're blind. It's indeed unfortunate that we're unable to glimpse the unusual animal, said the other. The third, quite annoyed, joined in and said, We don't need to see it with our eyes like with other things. If we can only touch an elephant, we can know what it looks like. It so happened that a merchant with a herd of elephants allowed them to touch one of his elephants. One guy was on the trunk of the elephant and he said, the elephant is a snake. It's long and round and very strong. What do you think the second man said? You're completely wrong. He was touching underneath the elephant and said it was like a big bag of buckwheat. And the third guy, he's touching the leg of the elephant and said, man, you guys are blind. It's like a tree trunk. Well, as you can imagine, they argued for hours, each one insisting that his perception alone was correct. It was a textbook case of the blind leading the blind. Each of the blind men was correct in his assessment of what he was touching, but none had discovered the true nature of the beast. After all, how can anyone describe the whole until they have learned the total of its parts? And describing addiction is exactly like this fable. When we focus on only one element, we miss the entire picture. So if we were to concentrate on maybe only what drug is used or for how long, we miss the mark. If we examine only behavior, we describe only part of the puzzle. 
If we talk about genetics and family patterns of inheritance, we also fall short. If we accept that addiction only exists with trauma, family history, poor self-esteem, peer pressure, or co-occurring disorders like anxiety, depression, or bipolar, then we miss out as well. Addiction involves many elements, but it's only by combining all of them that we're able to grasp its true nature. Addiction is hard to define in one sentence, but it is accurate to describe it simply as a chronic brain disease. That means it lasts a long time. So treatment cannot be short. The traditional way of doing things has assumed that patients entering addiction treatment should be cured and able to maintain good and lifelong recovery following a single episode of specialized treatment. Things don't work out that way in chronic diseases, though. More than 50% alternate between cycles of recovery, relapse, and repeated treatments over many years before achieving stable, lifelong recovery. Addiction causes crises, but it can't be treated only as a short-term crisis situation. You must compare apples to apples. Think about other chronic diseases, like how many diabetics or asthmatics or hypertensives have perfect control after just one treatment episode? None. And we don't expect them to have perfect control from one treatment either. For some reason, we expect there to be perfect control of addiction. I mean, if somebody has diabetes and they go to the doctor and they get it controlled and everything's going well, but the next visit, the blood sugar's high. The insurance company does not tell the doctor, hey, we're not going to pay. We already paid for one visit. And the doctor doesn't look at the patient and say, what's the matter with you? You are a crispy, cream eaten dirtbag. It just doesn't make any sense. Multiple quit attempts are the norm for chronic diseases like addiction, no matter what the substance is. It takes about seven quit attempts to try to quit smoking, to try to stop using heroin, to try to stop using cocaine or alcohol. It would be great if people could get perfect control of their high blood pressure or diabetes after one treatment, but, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Decades of research demonstrate unequivocally that addiction is a chronic brain disease. Relapse rates for drug addiction are similar to those of other well-characterized chronic diseases such as asthma, diabetes, and high blood pressure. We can improve long-term outcomes for a range of chronic diseases when we intervene early. Since relapses are frequent, we can improve outcomes by extending treatment, planning to intervene early, monitoring, and making contingency plans. Pretending that the most likely process won't happen is simply failing to prepare or preparing to fail. That's the same thing. Addiction is a relapsing disorder and treatment is effective. The longer you stay sober, the better the chance that you'll stay that way. Now, I know that's obvious. Most relapses that happen do so in the first year. Most of those in the first six months. Most of those in the first three months. So if we can just convince you or if you could just convince yourself to just keep going, you'll increase your odds of staying that way. Success builds success. Plus, if you do slip, get right back on the path. No recovery time is wasted. By definition, if you're in recovery, you're growing. If you've ever had a period of sobriety and then you slip and you get right back into recovery, you still grew. Your life wasn't wasted having been sober. You're different. You learned. You grew. The point is, it's not as black and white as starting all over. Just get back on the beam. After three years, the odds of remaining abstinent remain high and stable, but there is no cure. Like other chronic diseases, addiction requires an ongoing active disease management strategy. New technology, like these brain scans, reveal a great deal about addiction. These scans reflect the common and predictable brain changes that occur as a result of addiction and recovery. If you look at this brain scan image on the upper left, you see it's a normal brain. I don't like normal as a descriptor because there's no normal person. We're all colorful, which is great. It makes us interesting. But the point is, the top left image is of somebody who is not an addict. In contrast to that image, which shows uniformity and symmetry, the other images are not as pretty. The top right and bottom left images are brain scans of people exposed to prolonged drug use. One relates to alcohol and the other to heroin, but it doesn't matter what the substance of abuse is. As you can see from these images, addiction causes global brain dysfunction. As a result, it disrupts our emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being. If you look at the top right and bottom left images, you can clearly see the fundamental changes that occur in the brain as a result of using drugs. 
The scary thing is that people with those brains, they think they're making great decisions. But are they? If you're in rehab and if you're thinking, well, you're different, then just realize this. If you're like most people, then like most people, you don't think you're like most people, but that makes you like most people. There is good news. Healing happens. The one-year abstinence scan reveals that healing does happen when people remain abstinent. We can see how much the one-year abstinent brain is healed when compared with the other two scans. The benefits of recovery are remarkable and physically evident. Even though more healing will continue to occur, that first year is a crucial time of healing and recovery. The brain continues to grow and transform and heal throughout our lives according to what we do. The brain is more like a muscle or a piece of clay than a fixed slab of marble. With time, the majority of the brain changes actually normalize. That's right. If you can stay sober, your brain will most likely grow in size and remarkably, your thinking and coordination can improve within the first 30 days of sobriety too. The brain grows in the direction of what you do. So if you want a sober brain, do what sober people do. Speaking of sober people, how much is addiction an inherited disease? One of my favorite studies on the subject of heritability and addiction was done by Dr. Lee at Indiana School of Medicine. Dr. Lee exposed randomly selected rats to two bowls of water, one with pure water and the other spiked with alcohol, or vodka water. Most of the rats that tasted the vodka water decided it was not for them, and they drank only the pure water. Sure enough, 10% of the rat population began to congregate around the vodka water. Those rats were then selected out to breed with other alcohol-preferring rats. After a few generations, the study revealed a strain of alcohol-only preferring rat was created. That is, there was something that was passed down generation to generation that actually produced the disease of alcoholism in a lab. Indeed, these rats became rataholics. The alcoholic rats even exhibited addict-like behaviors. They exhibited a compulsion to drink alcohol until they were drunk and they tried to stay drunk. When exposed to alcohol, they would drink as much as they could as fast as they could. They would drink, 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 and then pass out. They would get up, they were hungover, and they also fought more with one another. Some of them stopped showing up for work, and the researchers even had to call Rodent Child Protective Services on quite a few others. Addiction is not a moral or characterological issue. It's a disease. Study after study reveals that addiction is heritable. It's about 50% genetic, just like type 2 diabetes. And since addiction can develop in an animal lab model, we know it's a disease. Why? Simple. Animals don't have existential angst, poor moral character, and they're not watching too much TV. The development of addiction is not simply a matter of learned behavior or poor moral fiber. To help answer the question of how and why addiction develops, we turn to our biology. Specifically, we ask, do addicts experience a different physiological reaction to drugs than non-addicts? Is that what makes them addicts? The problem is, you can't study an addict because their brain has been changed already. But we can do the next best thing by comparing how drugs affect their offspring. Researchers found alcoholic men and non-alcoholic men who had 13-year-old boys. They gave these 13-year-old boys a beer or two or three, tested their response, and then compared them. This bar graph has three columns. The middle green one represents baseline or resting amounts of the feel-good chemicals known as endorphins. This is how much of the stuff you got when you're not doing anything fun or exciting. So what do you think happened when the boys drank? The ones with non-alcoholic fathers did feel a little good. That's them on the right yellow bar. It went up a little and why not? Alcohol's a social lubricant. These boys felt good when they drank on the order of what you might feel if you ate a great broccoli and cheese casserole. Even if you don't like a broccoli and cheese casserole, realize that they used only the freshest broccoli and the greatest cheese. Nonetheless, meh, it's not so tremendous, I know. But the ones with alcoholic fathers had a much different experience. Their pleasurable response was considerably larger. In them, alcohol released much more of these feel-good neurotransmitters. They felt great. So here is the point. These boys did not decide they wanted to have a different reaction. They never had beer before. Just by the nature of their dads having alcoholism, 
their biology set them up to have a much bigger response. Genetic characteristics elevate the risk of addiction in other ways, too. The young men with positive family histories for alcoholism reported less unfavorable effects from drinking than young men who did not have addiction in their family. Those whose dads were alcoholic reported feeling less drunk than those whose dads were not alcoholic. This self-rating was confirmed by measuring how much their posture deviated from the midline when standing. Those whose family members did not have alcoholism swayed more than those with positive family histories. In fact, those whose dads were alcoholic hardly swayed at all. They could even walk on stilts and walk on a tightrope. They were hardly affected. But that's not all. The family history negative group, they also scored worse on thinking tests. In essence, there's something in the biology of these predisposed youth that enabled them to hold their liquor better and think more clearly. Study after study demonstrate that family history positive groups exhibit more rewarding effects from alcohol than family history negative groups. When they drink, the family history positive groups feel better, more pleasure, and less anxiety. It is almost as if those of us who are biologically predisposed may be built to enjoy more of the positive benefits of the drug while experiencing fewer of the negative side effects. This demonstrates a real biologic difference that helps to explain why some people are more drawn to use drugs than others. Other studies have reinforced the inheritance factor by demonstrating that a family history of addiction can increase an individual's reactivity to stimuli and stress. Simply stated, people who are genetically predisposed to addiction appear to experience more stress and stay stressed for longer periods of time than those who aren't predisposed to develop addiction. But that's not all. Positive family groups can experience notably more stress-reducing effects than negative family groups. Increased stress, coupled with higher pleasure and more stress-reducing effects of drugs, helps explain not only why some are predisposed to use, but also why they use excessively. Then again, anybody can develop addiction. A genetic factor that helps explain why addiction develops more in some people than other people is in how the brain's dopamine machinery works. Take alpha males and non-human primates, for example. They aren't stressed out about eating or mating. They rule the roost. The lower ones are freaked out much of the time. They think, mm, will they kick me out? Will I get enough to eat? Will I get a mate? Oi! So when cocaine is introduced into a pack, the alphas who feel pretty good already don't develop addiction. But the lower ranking ones feel really good when they use cocaine because they're basically self-medicating. What the researchers discovered on autopsy was that the machinery that processed dopamine in their brains didn't work very well. Stress interfered with how good they felt. In contrast, the alphas felt content and fulfilled already, and they're less likely to find as much value in drugs as those whose brains are significantly changed from maybe not having enough dopamine machinery to feel adequate reward, adequate motivation. In one of my favorite human studies, Subjects were given the stimulant methylphenidate or Ritalin, and their brains were imaged using fancy equipment, and they were asked whether they liked the drug or disliked the drug's effects. Like the not-stressed-out alphas from the previous primate study, people whose dopamine functions was high did not like the drug. However, people with lower levels of dopamine found it pleasurable. Here is yet another biologic basis for a disease once pinned as a characterological flaw. We've also discovered some protective behaviors that decrease the chance of relapse. Some factors increase the risk of developing addiction, while others are more protective. Families that eat together more nights of the week than not and kids raised with faith in their homes have less incidence of addiction. So decades of research reveal unequivocally that addiction is a disease like anything else. When you look at the dysfunctional heart here and the dysfunctional brain, it's clear that in addiction, the brain is a sick organ while the heart is the sick organ in heart disease. The sick organ system in addiction is more specifically referred to as the addiction pathway or the dopamine pathway. It gets sick and it stays that way. We know that addiction is associated with chronic brain changes. No matter how long you stay sober, you're always going to be an addict. But the good news is that many of these brain changes reverse with periods of abstinence because the brain is more like a muscle and a piece of clay than it is like fixed marble. The brain heals, but it's a chronic disease. It's like we all start out as cucumbers. Most people experiment and do not develop addiction, but once an individual has the disease, 
he or she is changed forever. If you turn a cucumber into a pickle, can the pickle ever go back to being a cucumber? No. Once a pickle, always a pickle. But does this pickle think it's a pickle? No. It's sitting there trying to hang out in the fresh produce section with all the other cucumbers. And the cucumbers are saying, hey buddy, you're a pickle. Now what does a pickle say? Well, I'm not a pickle. You should see that guy. He's a pickle. You know what? We're all delusional pickles. It's best that we stay out of the fresh produce section. A common myth about addiction is that addicts just need more willpower. But in reality, the problem isn't too little willpower. The problem is that addicts have too much willpower. This may appear to be an incredible statement on the surface, but it's one that can be explained by defining willpower. Willpower is the combination of discipline and diligence. It is the trait of resolutely controlling your behavior. Addiction is when people keep using despite negative consequences. Some of these negative consequences can be terribly painful for the addict and his or her loved ones, extremely expensive, or even catastrophic. These consequences show up as signs. Health fails, social support repeatedly begs the addict to stop, the legal system may express concern, and employment is affected. When the signs are everywhere and obvious that the addict should stop, what character trait, above all others, must be summoned to continue using? That's right, willpower. Like this driver on the moped in the upper right. Willpower is needed to keep going even when there's negative consequences like wreck after wreck after wreck. I love this guy. He keeps going. People are trying to help him, maybe try to stop him. He hits two cars. He hits this other moped and yet... Bam! Into a bus. Now he's clearly dazed. He's walking around. He doesn't know maybe where his helmet is, so he's picking that up. It's good to be safe, I guess. Other people are staring at him. The funny thing is, is right here, somebody actually helps him get back on his bike. You know, maybe that's his chief enabler. I don't know. But it's not over. He decides he's not had enough. He gets on his moped and he falls in the hole. It takes a lot of work, a single-mindedness of purpose to persist even against strong deterrence. Addiction requires sustained and heroic effort to keep going. For example, it takes careful planning and cunning to remember which lies we told to who and to develop better hiding places for your stash, just to name a few. Covering one's tracks, Lying and evading trouble also require discipline and diligence. Without considerable effort, without willpower, problematic substance use would hardly develop into addiction. Addicts have a lot of willpower, too much in fact. It spills over into other life arenas making them willful to a fault. Addicts often need to run the show. Addiction is the only disease where the patient comes into treatment with his or her own treatment plan already formulated. When we assess a new patient and make our recommendations, we're frequently met with resistance not found elsewhere in the field of medicine. Imagine you were diagnosed with a cancerous tumor and the physician recommended a course of treatment that would grant you the greatest chance of success. Now factor in that such treatment would not be convenient and might require you to make some sacrifices. How would you respond? My guess is that most folks would accept the sacrifices and move forward. No one tells the cancer doctor what to do, but in my field, Patients often tell the doctor exactly how to treat them. Treatment is geared towards getting out of the so-called comfort zone. There are various reasons why someone in a life-threatening crisis can't enter treatment. Other doctors aren't likely to hear the same excuses for not following the treatment plan as docs like me are. On any given day, I'm likely to hear that people can't follow advice because they have to do the laundry, that they have a possible job interview maybe, perhaps, or they want to get that elective appendix transplant operation. Addicts are using their willpower when they determine their own treatment plans. Addicts are not encouraged to develop more willpower. Actually, they're encouraged to let go of their willpower long enough to start the healing process. When I hear others say, why don't they just quit? It reflects how little these folks appreciate that addiction is a disease. No one tells the diabetic to just quit that sugar stuff. Quite frankly, Willpower is not a treatment for other diseases, so why would anyone assume that it's a treatment for addiction? If it did, we could just tell patients to try harder no matter what disease they had. If you don't believe me that willpower can't cure a disease, 
Try using willpower next time you have diarrhea and see how successful you are. Addiction isn't caused by lack of willpower. It's not caused by stupidity or lack of morality or lack of religion. It's a disease. Many people still think addiction is simply caused by choice, but no one chooses to become an addict. People do choose to experiment, sure, but simply choosing to use once or twice does not create addiction. Most people that smoke don't become chronic smokers. Most people that drink do not become chronic drinkers. Even most people that try heroin don't develop heroin addiction. Think about this. Have you ever chosen to have a cheese pizza? Probably. And did you choose a heart attack at the same time? No. But what's a risk factor for heart attack? Cholesterol. Cheese and many other foods are loaded with cholesterol. So choosing a risk factor does not equal choosing the disease that it causes. That's just one example in a great many diseases, like heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and some cancers, there is an element of choice. The choice first disease debate pretty much centers around these two brain areas. The prefrontal cortex is the purple part. This is where our conscious choosing happens. This purple part is the most human part of the brain. This is what has made us so successful on the planet. Any other large predator takes us physically in speed and strength, and our bite is just terrible. If you compare us to a lion, we're just sort of meat pies waiting to be devoured. Except for this huge part of the brain. It's an awesome tool. It's what's responsible for electricity, space travel, and the seedless watermelon, my favorite. It's a great tool. But perhaps we're too proud of our human brain because the green part, the subconscious part, is much more powerful. It controls survival. A good way to think about this green part is that it takes care of the four Fs. The fight, flight, feed, and mate. It's stronger because it's been evolving over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The purple human part, it's not as essential as you might think. To prove it, let's do an exercise. Imagine that I will really give you $10 million in cash if you can hold your breath for six minutes. Go. The purple part of your brain would say, hey, that's pretty good. Let me try and you hold your breath. After about a minute or 10 seconds if you're a smoker, the area in green starts sending signals up like, hey, buddy, let's breathe. And what does the purple say? This is willpower. This is choice. This is human. It says, no, I already bought a house. You should see it. It's awesome. The funny thing about this likely dialogue going on inside your head is that you're talking in the past tense as if it already happened. Is there a debate? Is there a fight between lizard and human? No, not in the least. Ultimately, it's like a bull elephant fighting a flea. At some point, you just fall down because you gotta breathe. There's no argument. There's no fight. The lizard brain wins every time. It overrides willpower and choice because it's stronger. It's survival. The survival center compels us to compete piteously for food, to ward off threats, to dominate territory, to seek safety, and to perpetuate our genes. It's ruthless and it's strong. Let's illustrate this with another thought experiment. Imagine that somebody came in right now with guns a blaring, as we say in Texas. What part of the brain is going to react and get you to safety before you're even conscious of what's going on? That's right, it's the green part of the brain. Now, why doesn't it consult the human part of the brain, the purple one, the, hey, we're so great part? Well, we would die because that part would think, do I owe him money? Does he have a gun permit? Or worse, one of you might think, man, where did he get those awesome shoes? So valuable time would be wasted and we would die. Our survival center would not be successful if it needed input from the human part. The lizard drives and we are in the back seat. Another exercise I'll ask you to do that illustrates the same idea is for you to look at the chair you might be sitting in. What parts of your brain say what? Lizard doesn't make up a story. It asks, do I have to protect myself against it? No, if it were a threat, you'd have a defensive position every time you saw a chair. It also asks, do I need to eat it to survive? No, otherwise you'd be gnawing on your chair right now. And it also asks, do I need to mate with it? No. Survival of the species is important, but, you know, let's face it, nothing's going to happen in that department if you try to mate with a chair. So, 
Lizard just quickly, automatically, subconsciously sums those things up. It's simply interested in survival. But the human part of the brain, the purple part, will look at the chair and say, hmm, man, I would love a big throne. Or I'd like a more comfortable chair. Or hey, this is a great chair. And it's better than that chair over there. Look at that guy. I'm glad I'm in this chair. The point is, you can basically just talk and talk and talk because the human part of the brain is where you make up meaning. The green part just cares about survival. After it experiences a stimulus, it quickly and decisively reacts without thinking or making up a story. In the past, without good science, addiction was seen as a moral failure. Instead of leeches, though, we treated addicts with disdain, judgment, frontal lobotomies, castration, sterilization, and excommunication. Today we know that addiction is not due to bad character or bad mommies, evil humors, or weakness of will. Due to measurable science and research, we understand that the disease organ system in addiction primarily involves a part of the brain we spoke about earlier called the mesolimbic dopamine system. This system reinforces crucial behaviors that are essential for survival, such as eating, drinking, sex, and social interaction, by making these pleasurable and memorable so you would be motivated to do them again and again. Remember, that you might feel happy, experience some pleasure when you dance, win an award, surf at sunrise, or eat a great meal. But the amount of pleasurable neurotransmitters that are released when certain drugs are put into the body are stronger and longer lasting than anything that happens naturally. Remember, the survival center is not the meaning maker. It's only reactive, and it's hardwired to respond to dopamine release. Dopamine makes us feel satisfied and content, it gives us pleasure, and it motivates our brain to repeat whatever behavior caused its release. When we eat food or have sexual intercourse, which is evolutionarily oriented towards procreation and survival of the species, dopamine is released, causing pleasurable feelings that let us intuitively know those behaviors are good things to do again and again. Food increases dopamine in that area by 150% over the normal baseline level. So a good meal will cause a surge in dopamine and create the desire to repeat that experience. Sex, which rewards the survival of the species through the act of procreation, can increase the dopamine surge by 175% over baseline. That much dopamine really gets our attention. But drugs increase dopamine much more than food, much more than sex. Alcohol increases dopamine release in the addiction center 200% over baseline. Tobacco increases dopamine by 225%. Cocaine increases it by 300%, and amphetamine increased dopamine by over 1100%. And the survival center, it knows to eat and have sex because of the high dopamine, but it didn't evolve with drugs. So in light of the higher amounts of dopamine, it just does what it's designed to do. Repeat those things because it equates those with survival. Such an enormous amount of dopamine surging through that center gives the brain higher reward recall and more motivation to recreate the experience. That much dopamine effectively smacks it right in the face. In the merely one millimeter thick region of our limbic system, an explosion of dopamine gets our attention. Our brains say, ah, I like that. Let's do that again and again and again. Nothing natural causes quite the explosion that drugs can create. No matter what the cause, when our addiction center experiences a surge in dopamine, It wakes up and says, pay attention. This is important. Let's do it again. The addiction center does whatever it has to do to carry out its functions of defense and survival, blindly motivated by the stimulus response mechanism hardwired through millions of years of evolution. It defends and drinks water and eats food and procreates to survive. That is all. Since drugs of abuse activate the circuit so intensely, they hijack the brain into thinking that using is survival. In other words, Addictive drugs powerfully, but deceptively, signal the brain that a survival fitness has arrived. In the end, addiction turns our natural needs into addiction needs. Our frontal lobes, in charge of our decision-making, they're the ones that partake in highly selective eating ceremonies. Our frontal lobes care about food preparation, presentation, and table manners. Our midbrain, the lizard, does not nibble delicately on crumpets It engulfs, devours, it consumes. Consumption is essential, and so it has value for that part of the brain. Our midbrain does not humanely dispose of an animal for consumption, it kills. The midbrain does not think and does not care. Now, 
I'm hungry as I'm recording this, and if I were to think, man, I would love to have a chicken sandwich, what would come to my mind is Chick-fil-A sandwich. Quite frankly, it's my favorite. Now, my survival center wouldn't argue and say, hey, there's a sale at Arby's, let's go there. No, it just says, listen, chicken's fine, let's just have chicken. Sex is an activity that the addiction center responds to by virtue of the fact that it raises dopamine levels and helps us to pass on our genes so that the human race survives. The midbrain is only interested in passing on the genetic code. Let's say we're pandas and it was panda mating season. What part of the brain is going to smell pheromones in the air and get doing what we're supposed to be doing as a panda to keep the species going? That's right, the limbic system. Now, This male panda bear doesn't have to ask the female panda bear out for months in advance. He doesn't have to convince her he's not as crazy as all the other pandas say he is. That part of the brain is ruthless. If he's the biggest, he's going to mercilessly attack other male panda bears, and he's going to get his genes passed down. Romance is nothing to that part of the brain. Romance and all that stuff, it's not in the limbic system. It's not in the survival center. It's in the prefrontal cortex. That's where we have bonding and love. The frontal lobe is what's interested in romance and love. In contrast, the midbrain does not make love, it procreates. It just wants to get it on, so to speak. Making love is not necessary for survival. In fact, if it could be interviewed, the midbrain would probably say that lovemaking is a waste of valuable time. Numerous animal studies have demonstrated how the drive to survive instinct can become tricked into thinking that getting drugs is more crucial than other behaviors that actually benefit survival. In my favorite such study, rats that were able to press a lever in order to stimulate their addiction center directly and promptly acquired the habit of pressing that lever. Some rats would press the lever a remarkable 10,000 times an hour, and they would continue to press the lever to the exclusion of other pleasurable and survival-oriented activities, such as sexually receptive rats of the opposite sex. After several weeks, Once the rats were nice and addicted, the researchers placed an electrified barrier that delivered painful shocks. They were interested in testing whether or not actual survival behaviors would be overcome in an addicted brain. When the rat attempted to reach the lever, it would feel pain, yelp, and jump back. Next, it tested the whole floor. When it couldn't find safe passage, it looked up at the lab tech as if to ask, Hey, buddy, a little help over here? Remarkably, the desire to stimulate their addiction center in the way that they had become used to was so strong that the rats placed themselves in harm's way, crossing the electrified floor and subjecting themselves to painful shocks in order to self-stimulate. Other experiments have further demonstrated the remarkable lengths to which animals will go to self-stimulate their addiction center. Addicted rats that were starved of food and water for 24 hours were put into a cage on one side of which there was food and water on a non-electrified pad. However, there was a lever on the far side of the cage across an electrified bridge. Instead of remaining on the side of safety, water, food, survival, and no pain, the addicted rats endured the pain of crossing the electrified floor and ignored the food and water in order to inject drugs into their addiction center by pressing the lever. What's even more remarkable is that addicted animals often self-administered stimulation to their addiction center by pressing the lever repeatedly until they died. Stimulating their addiction center had essentially trumped the importance of food, water, safety. The drive to survive instinct of the addict rats had been completely hijacked. Their bad behavior was beyond their control. They chose drugs over life. In this way, the addiction center, so crucial to survival, actually changes. It becomes driven more by reward itself than by rewarding actual survival behaviors. The addiction pathways extend to the four corners of the brain, sometimes orchestrating fiendish behavior intended to stimulate more dopamine activity in the addiction center. That is how good people can be driven to do bad things. Our brain is simply using to get what it thinks it needs to. And the painful electrical bridge that we metaphorically cross is filled with pain of hurting others and being out of integrity with ourselves. It's lying to other people and engaging in behaviors we wouldn't otherwise do. Being out of integrity with oneself is the worst type of pain. Addiction is hell. The addiction center cannot make an executive decision about whether or not to continue using drugs. Only our cerebral cortex can. 
but our prized cerebral cortex, it's not as instrumental in determining our behavior as we might like to think it is. In this regard, the addiction center is the CEO. When the addiction center motivates us to act, we act. The limbic system acting in survival mode can nearly be impossible to overrule. When faced with survival decisions, the midbrain overrides intention and rationality, commandeering the body and changing behavior to meet its single-minded agenda. In other words, addiction hijacks the brain. At some point, when addiction activates, people lose the ability to choose. If things were simple, it would be pretty easy to just say, well, okay, if you chose to start, then you can choose to stop. But addiction isn't that neat or linear. We know that the reasons why people start to use, they're different than the reasons why people continue to use. Addiction is a chronic disease, and recovery is a process that demands major changes be made. We ask people to change one thing. Basically everything. People, places, and things. It's a tall order. Now, it's really important to take a look at the environment, because environment can change behavior subconsciously without our permission. My favorite addiction environment study used a red room, which symbolized the environment or rituals of addiction. Everybody has their own red room, so to speak, but in this case, the rats literally had a red room. Some of our red rooms are bars, parties, and some of us just use and act out anytime we're conscious. In this red room, rats were given cocaine. They were only given cocaine in an all-red room. They were never given cocaine when they were not in the red room so that there was this indelible connection made between the red room and the cocaine use. Once they got good and addicted, we sent them away for a whole year so that the habit was extinguished. They were nesting and doing whatever rats do for that whole year. What do you think happened when they went back into the red room after a year? As you may have guessed, they got triggered. And how did we know that? Did they pick up the phone and call their drug dealer? Seriously, joking aside, The addicted rats did exhibit signs of physical withdrawal and drug craving, such as muscle twitching and searching for the drug. You might say, Doc, hey, that was funny, but I'm an alcoholic or I'm a stoner, so that really doesn't apply to you. Well, let me tell you, we can get animals addicted to alcohol, we can make alcoholic rats, but then they're just so hard to study because they pass out, they lose their coordination and they can't keep hitting the lever. They want to hit the lever, but they just can't. And if we make rats addicted to weed, well, they forget where the lever is and they just want to sit around all day and talk about the meaning of life and eat. The point is, you have to guard your sobriety. If you don't put it first, nothing will be second. This is why I tell people, if you want a Diet Coke, the last place you should go to is a bar. I mean, that doesn't make sense. It's like going to a brothel for a kiss. People who enter treatment are a distinct subgroup of substance users whose problems are particularly severe and intractable. Most addicts in treatment have at least one other co-occurring illness like social phobia, anxiety, major depression disorder, history of trauma, bipolar, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Treating both of these are necessary for good long-lasting recovery. While mood disorders and poor vision makes you have blurry and distorted view of things, medication, like glasses, can empower you to see things more clearly. Since addiction and other stuff affects one another, relapses cause mental illnesses to become worse while untreated psychiatric conditions make recovery less likely. The bottom line is, individuals with co-occurring disorders experience more severe and chronic emotional, relational, occupational, physical, and spiritual problems. So relapse prevention strategies and mood disorder management strategies must be part of an individual's comprehensive wellness plan. In summary, it's all addiction. It's not a disease that's limited to any one specific substance or behavior. Our subconscious brains hijack our conscious brains in the active disease state of addiction. Addiction is a chronic disease, and it doesn't come from a lack of willpower. Even though choice is involved initially, active addiction robs its host of volition. And treatments are effective, as long as you use appropriate treatments, which include daily management and relapse prevention, as well as mitigation strategies, and pursue happiness effectively not through cheap hedonic shortcuts. Make sure that you're getting the right type of care, including management of co-occurring disorders. Remember that you're a delusional pickle. Stay out of the fresh produce section. Recovery is as amazing as addiction is horrible. You choose the path you take. You can flourish in recovery. Anyone can.
It's been a long time since I watched it. 